Good afternoon, Laura Robertson from STAB. Laura, thank you for your time today. It's good to see you again. It's been a couple of years since we got to know each other through the Penn Fellowship, and I'm glad you could join us today on episode, I think we're on episode 149 of our Path to Follow podcast here at Gilman. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I um, still remember talking about Gatsby in your early days of English teaching. Well, I'm actually teaching Gatsby right now, which I'll be honest with you, after so many times reading and teaching this book, it's probably been upwards of 15 reads at least. I'm sort of bored with it. I don't know. I don't know if that's a personal thing or you've had that experience, but I almost so have talked it about it too to much. Summer, so we moved it to a summer read, I think, because of the same um, the same thing. Also, like the Jay-Z version came out. And we were like, they're just going to watch, uh, you know, it's going to be all glittered and not actually mm-hmm. the book. But there are some books that I feel that way about. That's what I love about Faulkner a little bit because you always can find something new in it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can, I can see that with Gatsby, although... Sometimes it's just having the right class and the right group of kids to reinvigorate a book for you. That's true. So what are you teaching at STAB right now? Yeah, so I am teaching 21st Century Citizenship, which is a project-based class. And my kids actually, it's very civics-oriented. We You start the year kind of with a grounding in the Constitution, and they do a pretty traditional debate, which is like the Roche v. Beard debate, which is very kind of canonical in poli-sci, and it's about the intentions of the founders in writing the Constitution and whether that was, you know, purely democratic um, or whether it was more um, to preserve privilege. And you read these kind of canonical things and they do a debate. And then they pick a contemporary Supreme Court case that is on the current docket and they brief it and then they form legal teams and they rebrief it collectively. And then they will argue it in front of a, a dean at the law school um, in about two weeks. So right now we're deep in the group brief writing. Hmm. We've had um, the woman who teaches legal writing at UVA come in and talk to them about how to write a legal brief. And then they write their own. And then based on which side they pick, they get to join teams, and now they're writing a collective one, and then we'll have a bunch of different people come in and work with them on their oral arguments, and then they will do it in front of the whole school on the 28th of the month. Wow, that's interesting. So you really have access. I know UVA is right down the street, but you really utilize the proximity of UVA. I think we've been really lucky um, in that people are super generous and there is some crossover with parents. So the woman who teaches legal writing is a phenomenal gifted educator and lawyer. Um, and her children both went here and one of her kids was in this class. And so she's been always very generous, but I do think one of the things I learned, um, from my former teaching partner in this class who happened to be our former head of school was a lot of times if you just ask, People are really generous with kid, for kids. And a lot of times, you know, people who are teaching older students or who are in, you know, a business school setting or a law school setting love to come and talk to high school kids because they're young and shiny, enthusiastic and curious. And it's a totally different way of being with, with young kids or younger kids. Um, I'd also just say, like, I think we've been, we have some alums, like we have an alum named uh, Malcolm Stewart, who was with the Solicitor General's office, and he has been incredibly gracious in my class, but he always talks about the best preparation he ever got for being the, like in the Solicitor General's office and arguing in front of the Supreme Court was being an English teacher. So there's also a lot of correlation between these people having taught a little bit, um, maybe at a secondary level and wanting to come back. But yeah, we do try to make the doors open to the community and we do try to do some experiential place-based learning within our community, which I think you guys do at Gilman as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really a mission of our, our senior seminar program, which are like transdisciplinary and very project-based and very reliant on the kids doing the majority of the work with us supporting them and, and coaching them. Um, it's probably more akin to like what you do as a coach Mm -hmm. Um, than standing at the front, like, well, I have to give them some of the guardrails because the expectations and the final assessment is so public um, and such high stakes. Like, it's really my job to support them getting there. It's not, I don't need to tell them 
how hard they need to work or any of that because the assessment does that for us. <laughs> um, right. It's going to be very public. It's going to be very high stakes, and they're going to be prepared because they don't, you know, they want to do well in front of their families and and the entire school community. So is STAB, is, is the entire upper school project based, or is it just this particular senior class? It's a variety of different classes. So we believe in long periods. So we have 90-minute blocks. We're in a modular schedule. So um, I don't know, like Madeira is a girls' school. I don't know if you guys do any crossover with, like, dances and things, but, like, Madeira school is also in a modular schedule. So we have um, six about six week mods where kids are in four classes at once and then they go to the other four classes and then they go back or they might have electives. Um, so because we believe in a long block and a 90 minute block, you will see hands-on learning happening everywhere in our school. Mm -hmm. The nature of this project is probably much more for seniors. Like I don't think I could do this with younger kids and they have had a full year of American um, history and literature, which I think does set the stage for me, because I think if they didn't have a, a pretty solid foundation in like the Constitution, it would be hard to do this high level of a project. But mm -hmm. we, you know, we believe in in good pedagogy, and we believe that it takes many forms. And so we're not like strictly one or another. We're whatever works best for the class, the teachers, the kids right. at that time. And I think having a flexibility of methodologies is really important. You know, because I'm going to teach very differently if I'm teaching a ninth grade English or history course than if I'm teaching my seniors who've elected to do this project and know what's, you know, they, they we do it every year. So they know what they're signing up for. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm teaching U.S. history for the first time this year. I'm doing a couple sections of American Lit. And honestly, I've been loving U.S. history because it's, it's not as... Um, it's different than teaching English, I feel like, uh, because you of... You should embrace American studies. If you're doing both, that's how we got to American studies. I think so. I mean, I think we're maybe moving in that direction here at Gilman, but I I don't know. I, I There's so much crossover. There's so many things that I'm thinking about having taught the American literature class for so long that work in my U.S. history class. But I do think you know, in an English class, you can almost throw out the discussion questions and sit back and watch the class discuss something. But in U.S. history, there's a little bit more need for different media and like bringing in the, you know, the Netflix special or the YouTube video or lecturing or PowerPoints. Um, so it's testing me a little bit and I'm enjoying it a lot. But I feel like we have 80 minute periods too. I feel like 80 minutes is so long to just you know, stand up there in an old school fashion delivering the information. Half the class will fall asleep if I did that. No, it's really about, there's just this amazing article about the blend of inquiry-based learning with direct instruction. And I think it, you know, it depends on who you are as a teacher too. Like I teach with some masterful folks and I wouldn't say that they just stand and deliver, like they create an experience. Mm -hmm. is what I would say for these children. So there's a blend of video clips. And um, actually, I think, you know, Jordan Taylor was in, was a mentor when you were there. You know, he's a masterful creator of that experience. And that's when we, we moved towards American studies because he was teaching U.S. history and I was teaching American literature. And we were, like, way on different sides of the timeline. And I was like, this is such a missed opportunity. We both did American studies as um, undergrads and grad students but um you know a lot of what he would do is just like curate this different experience for kids so they'd be looking at you know like when we taught lincoln's assassination we did um lilac you know the Walt poem, whitman uh, the whitman poem mm -hmm. and that specific stands about the lines and lines of the people and the crepe veiled buildings and all of that and then we looked at actual photography of the time of the funeral train. And then we looked at like some clips from Lincoln. And then we, you know, did some documents. And like that whole experience, I think, really gets kids into understanding the connections between historical events, moments, and like cultural expression of them, mm -hmm. which is what I've been most interested in getting kids hooked on, you know, to understand that art comes out of comments on, reflects on, 
you know, whatever's going on in the world. And now, of course, all these children have lived through a historical moment. I always used to say to them, we look at these moments and like, it's not fun to live through a historical moment. It's not fun to like be the civil rights marcher and have like the hoses and the dogs. Like that's really hard. Now they've all lived through a historical moment. They realize how less than fun it can be at times. And so I think understanding the correlation and the conversation that goes on between what what is produced and what is kind of enacted or experienced um, yeah. is really great. Now, how often do you bring in current events into your American Studies classes? Because I remember when I was in high school, I always wanted a little bit more current events and what's going on in the world and you know what's coming up with this upcoming election. And now as a teacher, I'm like, well, I would love to do a little bit more of that, but I also think it's important to have that foundation of history. And you know, you only have so much time. Um, so I, I'm really trying to balance bringing in current things to talk about with teaching the actual history. Yeah, so, you know, in citizenship, I have a lot of free freedom to do that. It's just my class and I'm the only teacher. So we always start with like a little check in about what are you reading? What do you, because I also want them to be reading and engaging and informing themselves. Um, in, and we do, you know, apologize, like that is the, the format of the class. So that's like a daily occurrence. In American studies, they actually bring, begin, their first unit is called a prolegonum. It's a setting of terms and it's quite contemporary. So they actually start with the, the kind of the immediate present and then move backwards. Um, and so it's kind of the beginning of the year is really establishing the themes of the course through something pretty recognizable. And given that we live in Charlottesville and the events of 2017 kind of rocked our world and that we have James Baldwin as a summer read, we kind of look at look through different lenses at those actual um, historical happenings because they're in our space. Um, and we also do some stuff on 9-11 and historical memory um, that can lead us to kind of the present day in terms of, you know, the authorized use of military force, like a variety of different things that can kind of correlate. And then we've moved into doing um, the AP Capstone program, which is a combination of two courses, um, AP seminars. uh, You guys can look all of that up. But um, they, kids have to do a, a team media multimedia presentation that's based on like them writing a paper through a different lens. And so for our first unit, they, they come up with kind of a contested issue, whatever that is contemporary and have to look at it through four different lenses and then create a, like a solution or a conclusion to that contested issue that they share in a presentation form. And I think that's been really helpful. Um, Sometimes it's really nice for kids to have something tangible, concrete, and something they're seeing. And you can teach them that they can apply those same critical thinking skills and historical views and perspectives to what they're, they're seeing in the more, you know, more contemporary or more current um, culture. And so that's, that's kind of how we approach it. And I think it's been really successful. So do you think the like standard traditional history paper is important to produce anymore now that we have chat gpt which can pretty much just do that for us it doesn't do it very well um i did so we do assign all of our kids write a 10 to 12 page history paper on a subject of their choosing that has to be somewhere american they do a six to eight page one in 10th grader that is 10th grade that's more um, kind of global maybe a little more limited but um yeah i think kids i think for the research skills alone, for the curiosity alone, for learning how to learn about something alone, it's Mm -hmm. valuable. I also think the writing is really important. And as you design an assignment, so for example, I asked ChatGPT to write the legal brief for my kid's case. They chose the Rahimi case, which is a gun rights case and about, it's kind of dealing with last year's Bruin, um, Bruin case and trying to figure out like what regulations are constitutional. So I asked ChatGPT to write a the legal brief, and it could not do it. It could not do it because it hadn't updated post Bruin, so the precedent law was wrong. Um, and so I think like that can be the case. I think where ChatGPT can be incredibly helpful for kids is, you know, I want to write a research paper telling it. I want to write a research paper on 
you know, name whatever topic. Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which actually our kids are doing more like Michael Jordan and Nike or whatever. You know, what are the 10 good scholarly sources that I should read on Gettysburg in order to write this paper? Right. That's actually a great first step for some kids and looking at that and then. Can you find those sources? Are they actually real? Because sometimes they're not. I've yep. had kids find things that didn't actually exist. And then, like, what do I learn from there? Or, hey, you know, we use, uh, we've been playing with Conmigo a little bit, the Khan Academy um, teacher AI version, which is kind of cool. Um, and it will talk back to you and ask you questions, which I really like. So you can, you know, I think it, it can also help you generate your research question a little bit where you can say, like, what questions should I be asking about Gettysburg? Like, I only know it was this three-day battle, whatever. Like, what what are some areas of focus or what do people really look at? You know, what are some competing narratives? What are some contested, you know, histories about, you know, who fought or how they fought or who are the figures? Like, I think that stuff can be really useful to kids. I think they still need to learn how to write because writing is just thinking on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and... Like, you know, it's interesting because we've been experimenting a little bit with, with AI and a lot of my kids were like, well, like, yeah, like I, we had one science teacher who was like, hey, have it write this paragraph for you and then edit it to make it better. And they were like, it actually took longer to edit it to make it better than it would have just been to write it in the first place. So it will get better, right? Right. Um, and it will, and we'll have versions. Like, and I think there are maybe versions already where the lag in the you know, it's only available up to 2021 or whatever right now, that's gone. You know, it's current and it has all the information and it can do what you want it to do in an even fit, more efficient way. I mean, I'm just thinking like five, 10 years in the future here, like, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think as long as children need to learn how to critically think, they're going to have to write stuff down. Um, it's interesting, you know, we're in that boomerang of history moment. And um, I was noticing there was an article, I think it's the Swiss government, the Secretary of Education, or the, their version of that. They're moving all away from one-to-one -one technology and back to paper and, and pencil and back to book books because they're noticing gaps and lacks in kids' math skills, reading skills, writing skills, and they're really putting it on technology. I have no idea where we're going to end up landing. I think our kids need to be able to use all of these tools. And I think we as teachers need to be able to use all of these tools. And I think it's still really important for them to learn how to learn things. Like, I think that's one of the most valuable gifts that we can give them isn't about learning my content or your content. It's about learning how to learn content and also learning how to learn skills and learning how to solve problems and figure out you know, what makes something more or less articulate or stronger or weaker argument. Right. I agree with that. And I think you said something earlier about curiosity, which is interesting. I had my U.S. history class last week just go to the library, choose a book each day. We have we had three days during that week. Could be a different book, could be the same book, and then submit a personal essay about that experience of reading that book. You know, what was it like? What did you learn? What did you find interesting? And they all reported back and they were like, that was the best week of the year. You know, we just had the freedom to pick whatever we thought was interesting that's related to what we're learning in class and just go with it. And I think, I think fostering that curiosity is part of the job too of being a good teacher. And I think it's harder to be curious now because more is delivered to them. You know, they have, this is a generation that has never been bored. Right. Yeah. And boredom is, is great, you know? I mean, my kids would say I'm bored, and I was like, well, that's just lazy. Like, you're choosing that. And boredom is good. It's good for creativity. It's good for curiosity. Like, you know, if you don't have your phone, you're going to go find things to do. Um, I think that's really important. I also, you know, we used to have kids do an artifact project um, where they would just bring something in. It could be a family. It could be whatever. And they would do a blog post about it, and then they would kind of trace how it connected to different parts of American history. And some of those things were just amazing. And and I think having something concrete to latch on to, whether that's a book or it's like understanding, you know, I found like this temperance certificate from like my great-great-grandparents and my great-great 
great grandfather was like a member of the society and it was part of like the progressive era. And then I found a bookmark that said repeal the 18th Amendment. And I'm like, oh, these two things say are an interesting story about the relationship between alcohol and culture at the, you know, in the progressive age up till really the Great Depression and the repeal of the 18th Amendment. And so like, what can you do with that? And I, for me, it's always about, I want kids to be able to take a small piece of a puzzle and understand the myriad connections they can make between that thing, whatever that, if that's a poem, if that's a short story, if that's a historical event, if that's a photograph, um, and understand the web of connections that you can make, that you can almost connect anything to anything logically if you just know enough and if you can do the right research. Yeah, I, I like that. A really important skill for kids. One of my uh, one of my students said today uh, in English class because I had a paper uh, due today. She said last night it's like twelve o'clock at night. It's midnight. I was staring at a blank screen for like an hour because I couldn't figure out how to start this thing. And I was like, that's really good because, you know, that's such an important experience in writing, not knowing how to start that you need. I mean, I, I don't think this generation has ever had that experience before because everything, as you said, is at their fingertips. They've got all this knowledge. They could plug it into chat GPT and get some ideas at least. Sitting and looking at a blank screen, I think is, I think it's important for learning. It's productive struggle. Right? I mean, when you think about the things that you've learned best that are your most important lessons, they didn't come easy. And they didn't come without staring at a blank page or staring at an empty field or feeling like overly taxed about, you know, whether that's mentally or physically, you know, like those, that's where the, the learning happens is at that point of stretch. Um, you know, and I think it's good for kids and good for her for not doing the easy thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because she was trying to figure out her own thinking. I think there's also a little bit of a reticence. You know, there's there's more of a fear of failure, I think, with kids now um, in general, just because I think failure can be so public and the, the nature of, you know, cancel culture, whatever. Like, I think it is, it feels more fraught for kids to put themselves out there, to take a risk. And so the more that we can do to, like, create a climate where that's acceptable and expected, especially academically and intellectually, the, the more we can serve our kids. I think so. Um, Laura, let me ask you a little bit about like your own story and how you became an educator and teacher. And maybe we could start with your upbringing, where you're from. Did you grow up in Charlottesville and how'd you get to Charlottesville? Nope. So I grew up in Chicago. Um, I went to the Francis Parker School in Chicago. Um, Francis Parker is a very uh, long-standing progressive school. So John Dewey and Francis Parker were um, thought partners for pretty much all of, you know, Dewey started the lab school, Parker started Parker. Um, and so I grew up going to that school and um, I wouldn't say at the time I really, it wasn't like I loved it. Um, I rode horses, which is a weird thing to do in Chicago. I missed some school and I was always very focused on my sport. I competed at a really high level. I don't think I got the most out of my academic experience. I did well, but I love um, a couple of things about that school that have really informed who I am as an educator. One is they have a student government, um, self-run student government that meets weekly for 40 minutes, eighth grade through 12th grade. And the students are really, um, engaged in governing the school. So it was a very big deal, like when they changed the disciplinary thing about write-ups and the teacher didn't have to talk to you and we had a walk-up. Like the level of civic engagement at that school is really remarkable. And I think that that is part of the mission of that school, right? They, uh, Their mission is the school should be a model home, a complete community, an embryonic democracy. And, and that's lived in the school. So I got to see a school that was really mission-driven, really clear about who it was, and very progressive in its pedagogy. So very place-based, very project-based, very hands-on. Um, and I didn't ever think about being a teacher. I was going to ride horses for a living, and I actually took two gap years um, mm. to ride. And then in my second year, I really decided I want to go back to school, and I kind of missed the 
the timeline and I needed to wait until like I could enroll for the next fall, but I couldn't do December and I didn't really want to start college in December. Um, so I did a bunch of stuff, including I taught school in Kenya, why anyone would let a 19 year old teach. I don't know without any wow. training, but I really loved it. And it was really amazing. Um, and I still didn't think I was going to be a teacher. I'd always taught writing and I really enjoyed that, but you know, I just, I was in this amazing program and I loved these kids and they were so gifted and, you know, we have such, so many resources academically, like our kids have all these books and, you know, they had to take the O-level exams without the required text. Like it was, it was impressive. And I really appreciated education after that, but I had no desire. Um, I ended up going to NC State thinking I was going to be a vet, taking organic chemistry, realizing that was a bad idea <laughs> and coming to UVA because it had an exceptional English program. And so I, I did my undergrad and my master's in um, a total of five years, uh, three of them at UVA and in American studies and English. And then um, did a bunch of little things for a while and finally got a job teaching part-time here um, at St. Anne's 22 years ago, which is crazy to think about. Um, and I taught 10th grade English to start. It was a very different time. I think I think we required them to read nine novels, three of which, or two of which were Victorian novels back to back in the winter. I'm not quite sure how we all survived that. It was like day near two great expectations. Wow. Uh, so what's, yeah. I mean, what's changed since then? Why aren't we requiring that of our students now? It seems like they're so busy, but, you know, thinking about when you first started at St. Anne's, like they're reading nine pretty hefty books and getting it done. What has changed? I don't know if they ever got it done. It was a very different philosophy of time. I remember when I started teaching here, our headmaster was a wonderful man, said, you know, like the model day um, was, you know, the kid gets up, they start school at eight o'clock, you know, they have breakfast, they start school at eight o'clock, they go to school straight through the day until 3.30, they go do athletics until 6, 6.30, they go have dinner and then they do three hours of homework and they go to bed. And I remember having a newborn thinking like, not my kid, <laughs> like that's insane. I think we didn't have you know, one, there weren't the distractions, you know, that there are now. I don't think the club sport thing was quite as intense. Like, I just have kids that are so busy after school mm -hmm. uh, is one thing. And I, I'm not sure that the, that, you know, that that was valuable. Like, I do think it's valuable to have kids do hard things. And I design a very rigorous curriculum. And I'm not sure that, like, reading Great Expectations back to back with Jane Eyre with 15-year-old kids was ever going to be great. Right, you know, like, right. I think it could have been one or the other. Um, so I think it's partly that. I think we have a much different understanding of kids' development and mental health. I think, you know, we believe more in interdisciplinarity and getting kids to make transdisciplinary connections in their skills. And that takes a different type of learning and time. Yep. You know, collaboration wasn't as much of a thing. You know, a lot of those things that were, you know, 21st century skills and now we're, you know, a fifth of the way through that are just like good skills that kids need to have in order to be good humans and good, you know, employees eventually or teachers eventually or whatever they're going to be. And I don't think we were focused as much on that. We were doing school much in the way that our parents had done school and much in the way their parents had done school. And I think there's just been more neuroscience and there's been more development. And I think kids are different and we do have to you know, we got to teach who's in front of us, whoever that is. And, you know, they do need some new skills that those kids then didn't need, right? Like there wasn't social media. Right. There wasn't, like, they didn't have cell phones. Right. It, you know, so it's a both and. And I don't think there's anything that's like really horrible or really exceptional. I think we just are where we are and we have to be able to, to meet the kids where they are and help them be their best selves. And I'm not sure nine books in one year and 45 minute classes where you meet eight in a day is the best thing for kids. Now, maybe it was at the time. Yeah, I hear that. I think you're right. Uh, the 90 minute classes, you seem pretty adamant about that, that those long periods work really well for you. And I think they work well here at Gilman. I'm actually leaving Gilman next year. I'm going to a school up in Connecticut, Brunswick School, which is GA's, I guess, brother yep, school right I there. I know right where that, yep, I've been there because we were at GA last year. 
and um, their classes are a little bit shorter. So I, I thinking about that, I'm going to adjust, you know, 80 minute periods, which I feel like I have to pull in all this different media and change it up every so often into 45 minutes seemed like nothing at all. Um, but I'm curious why that's such a important thing at St. Anne's is that you have these long periods. Well, I have taught in every type of period. I have taught, um, you know, I, I, we had 50 minute blocks and 45 minute blocks when I first started here. I taught a back to back because like American studies at first was a double period. So that was a hundred minutes, four days a week. I taught two hour blocks at 8 a.m. most for about eight years. I wouldn't recommend that one. Um, and two hour blocks in the afternoon. I, what I like about long blocks is that opportunity to really get into something. Um, and I think that you can do it in shorter, I think 60, I think 45 is going to be a challenge. You're going to feel like you're racing, but you'll adjust because that's what everybody does. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really, you know, one of the things, and I'm sure everybody's done the same kind of ISM study and different studies of kids developmental, um, you know, whether it's neuroscience or just how, how kids are and how humans are in terms of transitions and adjusting and kind of eliminating transitions is really helpful to kids. So I think that's a big part of what we believe is that, you know, every time you have to go to a new class, like you're asking a kid to do a different thing mentally or losing five minutes at the beginning or five minutes at the end in order to prepare for all of that. And so that's why we really moved to those longer blocks. And we did a lot of studying we have a whole web page about our schedule. You are welcome to look at. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, for us, especially in a class like American Studies or Citizenship, like to do deep work, you just need time. Yeah, I think so. And for my kids, like they're grappling with, you know, things that like people have been to law school and practice law for decades in order to be able to do what I'm asking them to do in a month. And I'm not sure um, how that is going to that will work um um so that's that's kind of what we're what what we believe and and it's been my experience that longer blocks work better i think they can be a little challenging sometimes and i think you have to schedule them differently for a ninth grader than you do a 12th grader Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. movement is really important i always look at my class as kind of three acts right um and thinking about, you know, the first third and the last third, and maybe the last third is where they're doing kind of more of their own producing and making do some quiet work. And, you know, maybe the opening is, is more direct and then I do some kind of discussion and then they move on to producing something. So I, I like that cadence in my own pedagogy in class. Um, and you can do that in, in a 45 minute class. It just is, you got to be yeah. on it. Got to be quick. Um, yeah. maybe they're not 40, I think they're an hour, but still it's a little bit shorter. I think they're so. an hour. And, and an hour can be a beautiful thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 60 minutes. Sometimes you do feel like, you know, you gotta, you get kind of adept at like elevating the energy in the space, you know, yeah. after a certain amount of time and you can kind of feel like minute 45, 50, like where you want to. So I know you have to run in a second but one thing that we do on this podcast is we ask the guests to bring in a book recommendation anything that you've read or taught that has made an impact on you and I know that's pretty tough for a American Studies English person to choose just one but is there anything that you've read recently or have taught that you think you'd like to recommend to the listeners well we are currently reading and I do think it's interesting um, this book um, it's about curiosity. It says it's called How Curiosity Can Transform Your Life and Change the World. Um, he's coming in to speak, and he actually he's he actually goes around and tours around the, the the country looking for connection and trying to figure out what divides us and what holds us together. And his his answer is, is kind of a curiosity. If you're curious, right, that you can connect more deeply with people. And, and learn more things. So I, this has been a book that I've, you know, just been reading. I think it's worthwhile. I love Brene Brown. Um, mm-hmm. I think uh, Dare to Lead is one of my favorite books. Um, I've given it to a bunch of people. I think 
it models the type of leadership I really believe in. Um, I love the poetry of Maggie Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote Good Bones, and she has a couple of different beautiful little uh, small poetry publications that I really, really love. And then to teach, oh, I love all of them. I really love teaching Song of Solomon. Um, I really love teaching As They Lay Dying. Uh, yeah. I like teaching hard books. And I like to read just like some pop fiction for pleasure because you can't, can't all be heavy. <laughs> I agree. Well, thank you very much for the Rex. Thank you for your time today. It's been fun to reconnect and pick your brain a little bit. And I'm um, glad to hear everything's going well down at St. Anne's. Yeah, and I'm glad you're, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm glad that you're moving on, but I'm glad that uh, if you're, you're excited, I'm happy for you. Very excited. Yeah, should be good. Well, thank you, Laura. All right. Well, maybe we'll see you. Are you guys playing us for lacrosse? I don't know if we are. I'm, I'm working with the JV this year, so I don't know if we are, but um, maybe we'll see you guys. I know you have a new coach who's yep. coming from Taft, right, Nick? Yep, Nick. He's great. Awesome. Well, good luck. And uh, your, some of your players are doing really well at the college level, too. Yes, they are. UVA is going to be hard to stop this year. Well, once a saint, always a saint. We love them forever. we got a bunch of kids playing a bunch of sports at a bunch of levels, including uh, Kamora Johnson, UVA women's basketball. She's, I think, leading the nation for freshman women. Oh, wow. And Connor Schellenberg. I mean, we have a lot of great kids, and they do amazing things on and off the field, on and off the court. But got to put a plug in for my former advising, though, because she's killing it. Good stuff. All right. All right. Thank you. Everyone. See ya. All right. Bye.